everyone. You are listening to episode 278 of the At Percussion podcast. My name is Ksenia Kumlianovic, and with me are my gorgeous co-hosts, Ben Charles. Hi, Ksenia. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great, Ben. Thank you for your Hollywood smile, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Such a farmer. <laughs> ben always always gives me a, a big smile when I, I I try to pull up a, a new adjective every time for how amazing these people are when I introduce them and he always smiles so thank you for that <laughs> and gorgeous gorgeous Carly Vina oh hey Xenia how's it going going well how are you Carly oh I'm good I'm good you're inching closer to the end of the semester yeah yeah, actually, I think a lot of people this semester are finishing early because of this um, dreaded no spring break. But I suppose the plus side is we're closer to the end of the semester sooner than we would be. Hold, hold on to it. Hold yeah. on. Hold on, folks. It's, <laughs> it's um, intense. The is there. It's intense. Yeah, but but we'll we'll get there. Um, all right. So our release date is April 1st. Haha. <laughs> and today I get to tell you what happened in music history. <laughs> so a couple of birthdays, uh, 1873, Rachmaninoff and 1954, Jeff Prokhorov of Toto is born. Depends who, you know, you like more. That's okay. You can celebrate both. Um, 1917, <laughs> ragtime composer Scott Joplin died at the age of 49. Um, but then we move on to way more interesting stuff. So 2008, Scott Weiland left Velvet Revolver, one of my favorite super bands. So if you ever needed that piece of information, there you go. They, they broke apart because too many of their wives started, not too many, they all had one wife each, but they started showing up for rehearsals and nobody liked that. So maybe, maybe don't bring your spouses to rehearsals. Maybe it's intense enough as it is. But then we move on to Ben's favorite band. And here's a couple of, I, I, I mean, I, I like the Beatles. I've never been a huge Beatle fan. It's not like I caught the bug, but the stuff that's written about John Lennon and Yoko Ono is definitely like best conspiracy theory type of material <laughs> that I've ever found. So 1973, John Lennon and Yoko Ono form a new country with no laws or boundaries called Newtopia. Its national anthem is silence. Ben, do you know about this? Uh, I think so. I've heard about this. John and Yoko obviously had many sort of peaceful <laughs> protests. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I did a bit of research because I was like, what's going on? I said one of the reasons that the country was founded was to address Lenin's then ongoing immigration problems because the week in the week before he had received a deportation order. And all of this, of course, through satirical means to address it. Um, the country has no leadership and not all citizenship uh, is recorded as a result of the population is unknown. And utopia means it's a combination of two words, new and utopia, right? It's a new utopian society. So basically what happened uh, was that um, him and Diokono Ono had been living in New York for a year and they wanted to stay. But it also happened that Nixon was running for re-election and there was the Vietnam War which they were vocally against and would frequently go to rallies and sing, give peace a chance. And uh, also told people that the best way to, to take a, a crack at peace would be to vote against Nixon. So the Nixon White House uh, responded by ordering Lenin to be deported. Um, and then they said that uh, Lenin had been admitted to the country improperly. He had pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of cannabis possession in London in 1968, and the immigration law at the time banned the admission of anyone convicted of any drug offense. So there, they found uh, something in his past and, uh, and tried to get him uh, deported. However, that didn't work because everybody and their mother, including Bernstein and a bunch of authors and like everybody wrote a letter to say, please keep these people in the US and they did. But Ben, please uh, go ahead. Uh, what were you gonna add to this? Yeah, I just had a couple things. One, uh, John Lennon very famously lived at the Dakota building in New York City. And I've heard, and I can't verify for sure that this is true, but I think Leonard Bernstein also lived there. I, I do know that they were friends. Um, and during the same time period, I know John, John Lennon was being surveilled by the CIA or FBI, one of the two. And uh, he would often go over to John Cage's apartment and ask to use his phone because his, his phones were being tapped. Uh, but John and Yoko have this sort of reputation for being uh, clowns. And this was a, a period where obviously counterculture was was viewed as as weird hippie types and there's this great quote from John Lennon I love he says 
Yoko and, I, Yoko and I are quite willing to be the world's clowns if by doing so it will do some good. I know I'm one of these famous personalities. For reasons only known to themselves, people do imprint what I say, and I'm saying peace. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I mean, we, again, we know them. They are quite the, they're just quite the couple and they always would uh, be very vocal about anything they had with, you know, social justice or political commentary and so on. But they were also jokesters. And in 1970, they released a hoax on um, April 1st that they're having a dual sex change operation. So they're both, they said that they both checked in to a clinic and that they both are changing their gender. I don't know if that would be accepted quite as that funny today because no. that's not, I mean, that's a very serious matter, but I think that was probably a response to how people thought of them as nutcases and they were just like, oh, we belong together, but we think we should just swap gender roles and everything's going to be better that way. So I think they, they sort of played a, uh, responded with a joke to how people saw them. So that was our, our history for today. Aren't you glad that you found that out? And now I get to move on and introduce our wonderful guest. Uh, we have a rising star with us today. She was born in Germany into a family of Bulgarian musicians and started her education on the violin, but the instrument did not quite stick with her. But Badumch also, that was like a pun, um, but stayed with her brother, uh, who is the violinist and the concertmaster at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. So uh, quite high achieving family. Now, what's really interesting about uh, her to me is that she's quite an early bloomer. And I don't know if you can say that about a lot of people because um, she became the youngest member of the National Youth Orchestra of Germany at the age of 13. And at the age of 15, with the help and support of the leading German classical music radio station, she recorded her first CD. Can you imagine like you're 15 and the throw of hormones and everything else and you're mature enough to record a CD. That's crazy. Um, and then was the youngest semifinalist at the ARD competition in 2014 at only 20 years old. Um, she's won many prizes, including the Bavarian Art Prize in Music in 2017 and the Special Prize from the Mozart Society in Munich. And so many more that Google Translate didn't do justice when I tried to translate them from German. Um, her teachers include some of the most influential percussionists, not only on the European continent, but everywhere, um, the late Peter Sadlo and Martin Grobinger. Um, and she's been called by Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, for those of you who laugh at my German, that's South German newspaper. Um, she was called the queen of the drums. And you might have guessed it by now. Our guest is the wonderful Vivi Vasilova. Vivi, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Um, thank you very much. And thanks for the really nice invitation. <laughs> you, you really digged in into all, all of that. I'm impressed. <laughs> hey, we, we have to know. And, you know, it was a lot of there's there's so much material uh, materials out there on Vivi that are available to you if you speak German. I feel like you have been everywhere when it comes to the German speaking countries. <laughs> and there's so many wonderful interviews which I watched a lot of with like YouTube's closed captioning and then automatic um, translation to English. And it's uh, some of it works, some of it really doesn't. And some other uh, listeners of ours have sent in questions saying, could you please explain this thing that you talked about <laughs> in German? Wow. Because it's, it's hard. So we'll, we'll dive into some of that. We'll have to make you repeat yourself, but just for our English speaking audience, so we could help. Um, but I'd love to know, uh, first of all, where are you? What are you up to? How's COVID there? Let's start off with that. Yeah, well, I'm in Salzburg. It's snowing already for the fourth day. <laughs> it's really nice actually outside. And um, three days ago, it was a typical uh, COVID case, you know, like musical case. I, I mean, um, everything turned upside down. So until Friday, I was thinking that this week I will travel to um to north germany to the um to play the conjurer from john Colliano. i'm sure you know it. it's a really really cool concerto uh, with with the orchestra's philharmonie Südwestfalen. and and you know i was trying like the last four months to get to know will the concert take place will, will it not take place and on friday i knew <laughs> So until Friday, they were the orchestra was so motivated, which is really nice, you know, because they were calling me every day and um, 
yeah, and we want to do it, it will happen. And then on Friday, okay, it won't happen. And then the other news um, came that um, the Mozarteum, the university will close again because of some, I don't know, crazy singers who needed to party. So oh. now the director had like political pressure to close the university. So I was like, okay, so no concert. And I have to go back maybe to, to Hof where, where um, there's the, the house of my parents where I grew up. My parents actually don't live there anymore, but if there's a lockdown like this, I can go there and practice. So, so I was like, okay, I will go to, um, I will go to Hof, and I was like, oh no, it's go going to be like the first lockdown because exactly one year ago I was there for three months. Um, luckily, with my boyfriend, I think alone I would have um, gone mad. And he's a he, we we also play together, so we even could do chamber music in this time when you know, like I I still feel the first lockdown was like the the worst for everybody because it was such a shock and everybody panicked and you really didn't know is it safe to go outside to go into the supermarket so I was like oh no it's gonna be off again please please no and then um because I'm doing this um really really nice children opera maybe you've heard of it in Europe here they they play it already in all the operas um I have this really cool project with the Salzburger Festspiele this year um it's a children opera it's called Gold from Leonard Envers it's for one singer and one percussionist. It's it's really amazing. And it's based on this uh, children's story um, from Brüder Grimm, where there's this uh, Fisher family who don't have any money. And then the child um, uh, gets to catches a fish and the fish tells him, let me live and I will grant you a wish. And then the family in the beginning, they're really modest and she just wants shoes. But then they get they want more and more until it really is really chaotic. So this is a really, really nice thing for children. It's so interesting for percussion. You have marimba, vibraphone, you accompany the singer, but you also imitate the fish. You have so many cool sounds. So I, I'm doing this this year. So I called them and we would have had rehearsals now in the end of March in the Mozarteum. So I called them. We won't be able to do the rehearsals uh, because the university is closing. And then and then she said, OK, uh, you, we will bring all the instruments in the festival house, you know, where already, always the concerts in the summer are happening and the operas. And I was like, okay, um, and the rehearsals, will they take place? Because I will have to, you know, travel uh, between Hof and Salzburg. And they were like, ah, oh, but you can, nobody's here. You can practice here all day. Oh. So I was like, what, yeah. really? And then it was amazing. This was on Friday. They came in. They, I told them I need some time to pack everything. They were there in half an hour with this really, really big size of a fresh pilot truck. And um, yeah, we really have a really amazing class um, in the Mozarteum. So all my colleagues helped me. And um, because I'm, I have this other uh, premiere that um, per, a percussion concerto is going, it's called the Recycling Concerto. Actually, it should have taken place in November, but due to Corona, now it will be in June. So I need to start practicing this now. So I had all these crazy instruments also in, into the um, bring, bringing into the truck of the Salzburg Fashion. So also the um, the the woman from the Salzburg Fashion. She was like, "What what kind of instruments are these? Because it's so many, and so much rubbish. It's a plastic bottle, marimba free." four octaves actually, uh, which I had to build on my own. You know, you can tune it by air. I, I don't know if you have heard of it. Uh, and then uh, so many glass bottles tuned with water. Um, uh, how do you call this where you put the fl flower pots? Yeah, also also tuned also the whole octave. <laughs> so, and, and a lot of uh, other rubbish and junk percussion <laughs> and all this into the... And now, now I'm, yeah, I'm, I just feel so lucky because now I can, I have this really big room in the Salzburg at Beispiel and I can, I can practice there uh, the next two weeks until the university, hopefully it will open again on the 6th of April. We <laughs> so hope so. What happens to me at the moment. <laughs> Exciting. It's never boring. Who says COVID is boring? <laughs> yeah, it's not boring at all. <laughs> Well, Vivi, you mentioned this piece. I saw on your website that you're supposed to play on Friday, which it sounds like is not happening, but the, the Conjurer, the John Crigliano Percussion Concerto, 
And it's one of, I think, the most fascinating pieces that it seems no one knows about. I actually was fortunate to see one of the premier performances with Evelyn Glennis, Glennie and the Dallas Symphony in like 2008 or so, whenever the piece was, was coming out. Um, You're so lucky. So yeah. <laughs> um, and I know uh, the first movement especially was intriguing because the first movement, it's written, first movement is uh, wood, second instrument is metal, and third instrument is skins. And for anyone that's not familiar, the first movement, it's based on marimba with xylophone as sort of an extended range. And then all these like little wooden, like wood blocks. 18, 18 like wood blocks. Yeah, 18 wood blocks. Yeah, to, to sort of create an almost an unpitched register of the marimba. Um, so I, and I, I was just looking into the work. It looks like it was recorded in 2000, I think it was 13 by the Albany Symphony with Evelyn Glennie. Um, but for those that are the, the uninitiated, could you tell us more about this work? It's, it's really, really nice. So um, actually Martin already told me before that it's a really cool work, but, but I never uh, found somewhere to listen to it. Um, and, <clears throat> and now actually I should have played uh, Fazil Zai, a concerto from Fazil Zai, which is quite new. Uh, but due to COVID, we said, okay, let's do something which is smaller. So this is the cool thing. It's the only, it's, or I don't know if it's the only, but it's a percussion concerto for string orchestra. So usually the, the repertoire that we have with string orchestra is only marimba, only vibraphone. And this one is really, it's a full percussion concerto. You have everything in it, marimba, vibraphone, glockenspiel, timpani, tom-toms. So, it's a really complete, really, really um, interesting, has all the contrasts which percussion can show. Um, also hand drums, which I really love to play. And I'm always happy when, when in, the, in our contemporary music we have this. There's like, a, there's like a talking drum part, isn't there? Exactly. So the yeah. first movement is wood, like you said, xylophone, wood blocks and marimba. And the second movement is metal, like you said. So you have... Uh, the the um, it's, I think it's chimes in English, you know the big yeah, yeah. yeah okay chimes and uh, a really really wonderful second movement so beautiful really slow it's, it's almost like film music um, you have the vibraphone and then you play with the solo cello together it's really really nice and and this it's a very long slow melody which. You get uh, you hear in the violas, then you hear it in the violins, and in the end you get to play it with the cellist. So it's really, really um, very romantic. So it's completely different from the first movement, who is more like which is more groovy with with the woodblocks. And it's it's what what fascinated me a lot when when I started learning it one month ago is that um, it has so much dialogue with the orchestra, which is. I think it's also hard to to have a really cool like percussion concerto where you have this really direct dialogue. So um, in the first movement, you have this a lot with the with the violins, and they they have this crazy crazy sounds they do. So um, it it suits so cool to the woodblock. So the orchestration is really um, nicely made as well. You have this you do it on the woodblocks, and then the violins do this and then it's really really cool and then the third movement is so um, effective like so virtuous you have um, uh, uh, another thing is every movement starts with a solo cadenza so on on these instruments and the third movement is really on a talking drum <clears throat> for those who don't know it's, it's a African drum it's called talking drum because you can um, the, the it's it's tuned very low, but it's very flexible. So you can you uh, with with pressure you can tune it high. So in one moment you can do like lisan is a boom boom, and you can do a boom pop, and you can play like and you know change the change change the intonation, which is it's it's so 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 cool. And um, yeah, that's that's why it's called talking drum because you imitate the voice. And if you if you Google some like authentic African um, um, percussionists playing this instrument. It's, it's really amazing. Sometimes they also sing. And so this is in the first movement and then you get to uh, use those motifs in the, in the timpani um, part later on in the third movement. And then you also have this really crazy dialogue. You start with the tom-toms uh, together with the strings like boom, boom. And then it's like, papa. 
and it's so long like this and then you get this really really um crazy accelerando like more than double time with the orchestra together and um in the second part when you already are not with the orchestra so it's uh answer questions or the, the the strings are doing like boom and then you're like boom papa 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 and and it gets so mixed up uh yeah, really, really cool concerto. So, um, and and I actually, I don't know if you know, but you can listen to the version from Evelyn Glenny on Spotify. Yes. Perfect. I love hearing the excitement in your voice as you talk about this entire concerto, and I hope we all get to hear you play <laughs> yeah, are, it sooner. Do you think it's, are later. you going to reschedule the performance? Is it going to happen still, or? April 1st in one okay. year. <laughs> oh, in a, in a year. In a okay. year. Wow. <laughs> Yes, you know, it's like some, some, somehow on Friday I was quite euphoric because all this happens, all everything changed um, uh, so dramatically in, in the five minutes um, when I heard all those messages. But um, I must say, I wouldn't have learned it now in this time if, if I didn't think all the time I'm going to play it. So I'm so happy now I have it in my repertoire and um also i got to play it in in a um like uh, you know like when in university you play it for your class so i i could play we have a really a really uh, amazing uh russian corepetito do you say corepetito so like, uh, I, I didn't yeah i didn't have the piano reduction so i just gave him the practice <laughs> <It was> oh. <laughs> and we played the whole concerto so so I'm very thankful for that because I think it's so it's so bad learning something and then never getting to play it in a whole thing with with the um, you know with the orchestra or uh, at least with someone who is um, uh, who is imitating the orchestra. So and this we even had like a public because you know it was in the university for my class. So so this is. I'm happy about that. I think if I didn't have this, I would be like, okay, because then I don't really feel like I really learned it. So now I know I have it, I can play it, it's, it's cool. And yeah, it's, it's a pity with, with the orchestra, but I don't know, I'm optimistic that this, this whole crazy time will be over and we can use it well. I, I'm using it actually, I, I try to, to use it well and yeah. It sounds like, yeah, well, it will be that much more exciting, I suppose, a year from now when you finally get to play it. You know, maybe as we're speaking about yes. um, all the challenges and surprises that COVID has brought us in the last year or a little bit over a year, we have one question from a, a social media listener, Jay Vindell Music. Um, he or she is asking about tips for learning a new piece quickly. And I would extend that question even to how have you been able to adapt to the challenges of COVID, like you were saying, like, hey, I got to pack up everything I need for this piece right now and take it somewhere and just dealing with all the all the logistical challenges that we have. What tips do you have that have helped you not just like survive COVID and a pandemic and playing, but thrive? You seem to be musically thriving, which is wonderful. What, what Do you have any tips to share with our listeners? Uh, well, in those moments of panic, I think there's a really funny uh, saying in German, it's like, bitte bewahren Sie ruhe. <laughs> it's called, it means like, please stay calm. <laughs> and I'm actually not good at this, but I try. And, and in these moments where you just have to pack everything, I was like, okay, I can, the university was open until today, so I could I was actually carrying a conga bag with the hardware that I forgot <laughs> and to the fish below it was a little bit crazy on the bike but um with the with the thing with learning new pieces uh fast so mm, uh do you mean like because somehow you asked me two questions in corona times and besides or um well, I guess in, in general, um, the question from our listeners about how tips for learning a new piece quickly. Uh -huh. um, but it, I, yeah, the the second part of the question that's just from me about you know maybe how you've had to adapt to different practicing okay. situations through COVID. Okay. So um, yeah, there are a couple of things to learning a piece quickly. It really helps if you have a deadline. 
<laughs> because then you have the fire you 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 don't procrastinate because you know you it has to be done uh so this was for me problematic in the first lockdown and then i and since then i really um i appreciate so much deadlines and even if it's little deadlines even if it's only until next week this is so important because um in march one year ago i was just like okay do I have three months now? And then you make your plan, what you all, everything you want to learn. And of course, it's too much because you always are more. Uh, in German, we say that the eyes are bigger than than the the tummy. So so you 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 want to eat more than you actually can. So so I made a list which was very realistic. Then I was stressed because I thought ah, it's lockdown. I have to learn everything this now, and um, so. And because we didn't know when will the lockdown uh, end, uh, this you have this like free eternal time, and I think this is very unhealthy for being uh, productive. <clears throat> so so now in all the other lockdowns that we had, I really um, I just do my deadlines like in, in smaller deadlines like in ten days this has to be uh, this I have to be able to play this in two weeks and one week i don't know um and and um yes i think this is really important and we have the possibilities in the corona times i think to do this whether it's like you say okay i will want to record something uh, audio or a video or um i want to send something even if it's only if you don't want to record something on social media or on even if it's only for your family, you know, like, or friends, like, hey, look, I'm working on this, and you send something, um, and then you you get some feedback, because the worst is just to be on on your own with this eternal time and, and not sharing the music, because, yes, music is a language. <laughs> it's not only for yourself. So um, I think this this is really, this helps a lot. And about learning fast, when I need to learn, like play stuff, which I really like solo stuff with orchestras or or, or also solo, but um, or chamber music, which I learned by heart, I I started actually to just learn it by heart right away. Like earlier, I would think, ah, I I need to first get the tempo or get check the piece. I don't know, read everything through. Now I don't do this anymore. I just I, I, of course, I read it one time through, so I have some overview, but then I don't keep on repeating reading it. So I just, um, I just think, okay, I'm today I learned this page by heart. And, and you, you really feel good after that because you know you, you made something and, and then you see your progress, which also motivates you. And for example, in, in January, I was learning this uh, cadenza for, for the recycling concerto. There's a cadenza on two plastic bottles. So, um, and you have, it's so interesting. You, you let the, the air out. This is also a sound which has to be rhythmically. And every part, like, like the piece is around five or six minutes, but, but it has like four or five parts and each part has different sounds. So different things to learn, to read, different sounds you, you need to, to, to get and to check. So we all know this. It's like when we learn a new piece where it's completely new alphabet, you know, um, where in the beginning you feel like first class, ah, how do I read this? Um, when we have a new setup or, or a new crazy piece where the composer was super, super creative. So I felt like that and, uh, and then, you know, I don't know for me it's like the resistance is bigger than if i have to play to learn a bach on marimba i don't really have a resistance because it's you just read the notes the marimba you know everything but when it's something you have to build you have to check the sound it's it's much more of a challenge so so for me it really helps like um also have having a time like no uh, if you have the whole day to practice earlier I would think like okay I will learn um, everything today which I can I will do my best and and then you start procrastinating because it feels so endless and it's much easier if you say okay now uh, in the morning you start and you say okay I will until 12 o'clock I will learn by heart everything that I can and 
And this is somehow it helps me more because it motivates me to get through the difficult moments where you really have to fight your resistance. And uh, because you know, ah, at 12 o'clock, I'm gonna have a really delicious lunch. So you're like, okay, now I learn, I learn, I learn. And, and then after lunch, you can continue, you know, but, but earlier I would think like, okay, today I have to learn two, two pages, but maybe, maybe exactly these two pages are difficult and you need more. And then in the next day you learn three pages because the three pages are easy. So mm, yeah, for, I think learning fast is about, uh, really about fighting the resistance and learning by heart immediately because, because reading it, is, it um, trains your brain something, something else. Like for example, the conjurer, the first movement, it's so, it's so, um, uh, it's not comfortable to read because you have 18 woodblocks and uh, of course it's not the, the usual thing that you know every, every, what is everything so if I would need to read it every day again I would always take so long so, so now I just I read it one time and then I learn it by heart and and the other thing about learning fast is learn little things like don't say okay now I repeat eight bars very often eight bars is too much repeat two bars until they're in your head and then add two bars i mean it depends of course a lot on the music but but very often um if i start to repeat a too long passage um i don't i don't remember it and i just repeat and repeat and if i repeat a small small it gets so fast and then and then you go on you know ah, okay this i already have it in my head I go on and then you get motivated and this motivation helps you to to get to go on with more energy and yeah I think this this helps me a lot for learning fast that's uh that's excellent advice and also if you're along those lines we when we talk to Simone Rubino he talked about how he always learns the music first and then the mechanics second he said don't read the music at the instrument because you're trying to learn it physically as well as simply learn it up here learn it this way so if you don't have time to sit at the instrument if you're traveling you can always read the music so attack it like a conductor would um, look at the music first and then then play it. that also could be a helpful thing um maybe a quick question it said in your bio that you started uh your bachelor's in munich when you were 16 is that correct uh no this is uh pre like pre-college oh it was pre-college okay yes so i was still in normal high school mm -hmm. and parallel to this you already have uh, all the lessons and the lesson uh, this is when i started with sadio right right okay. okay so um that is what i wanted to ask about is you've studied with the late uh, and great sadlo and then uh, with grubinger as well and so many people wrote in and they were like what is it like uh to study with those two but before we go on uh, to that question i'd like to know because you've studied with two people who've had international careers um what is the best career advice you've gotten from either of them from my teachers yes i don't know if it's uh one advice um you can give us you can give us more share whatever you feel like sharing um i know i just have to think what what sadlo would have told me or what he told me then um i think i think then he he told me it's important that you um, that you know what that you know what you want like you you need to know who you want to be and then you work on this um, because especially in our um in in our subject in our um in the percussion world you can decide either if you play only marimba if you play only maybe you want to play only vibraphone or only just vibraphone maybe you want to to do the whole deal maybe you want to do only marimba and um so decide on what do you like best and and then work work on there um and also try uh, try to try to present yourself uh like this and um i think what martin well martin is like uh more um 
yeah i don't know it's it's hard because it's not like i sit in a lesson and then they give me this one advice you know <laughs> this uh, with martin it's like of course you have to play at the the the, the highest level that's possible um this is a really really the, this is the most important and then um he talks a lot about repertoire. It's so important what repertoire that we play. Um, and, and then he, he talks about, you need to get the things in the concert hall. So um, having communicating with, with the people who are um, organizing um, the concert halls, um, the, the, the intendant and, and these people, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, has he walked you through how to reach out to people and say, hi, my name is Vivi and I really want to play this at your concert hall? Well, I must say, like, for Sarlo, it was more sending you to competitions. And uh, for Martin, it's really he supports us so much, like all the class. He, um, I, um, he helped me with this great talent scheme that I'm now in the Vienna Concertos. He he presented me there, so this is thanks to him. This is amazing. I'm I'm so grateful for that. Um, it's it's a scheme where you are two years you're supported from by the Vino Concertos and you get concerts and projects. <clears throat> and uh, then he organized this thing in January now, which was which I thought was double cool because not only that um, because we had this in January, in the middle of lockdown, we had this big thing where we were motivated to give our best to practice a lot. And this was an audition uh, for a concert in the really um, big festival. It's the biggest festival in Germany for classical music, Schleswig-Holstein Music Festival. Uh, you, you mentioned Leonard Bernstein before that, so he, he founded that festival. And um, he invited the intendant to, to, to the Mozarteum to listen to us all in the class. So this is amazing. I never actually heard of something like this. I think this, and Martin really like makes these things happen. So he says, okay, you have to come now, <laughs> listen to my students, and then you will invite some of them to play in the festival. So I did this in January, and now I can play in the summer in Schleswig-Holstein Music Festival. And I'm quite positive about that one. I mean, you never know, you know, COVID, but last summer they were the only festival that actually had live, live public, live music. Uh, so, so he actually, he just, he just is active and he, he helps you do it. And um, yes, when I have, when I have like discussions with with agencies or promoters or which program to decide on which concert i can always talk to him and he will always tell me his um, opinion and this is this is yeah this is so amazing so like i i love it in the Mozarteum. every day i'm thinking like it's so awesome it's more than i ever would have imagined and but you know it's not one advice it's always different advices to like like having like pursuing a career is you have so many different challenges and it's not only one thing unfortunately <laughs> yeah yeah of course but he really he it's not like there's no question where he would say i oh, know i'm just your teacher he would like help you with everything and this is really really nice that's that's lovely um i was uh talking uh, on a previous episode about how Yu Wang and uh, Lang Lang were not allowed by their teacher to go, um, by the professor to go compete. And why? Because he could just bring in a conductor or a concert presenter into a lesson or whatever and say, hey, why don't you listen to these people? And they would get engagements. And then I thought how that happens very, very rarely in the world of percussion, mm -hmm. but definitely with someone like uh martin is that um he is so influential and obviously he he knows what he's doing he doesn't just present anyone to these people but he can also do that he can sort of in, induct you he can bring you closer um, and put you in touch with the right people where that collaboration would be very fruitful which is wonderful carly yes could we do mateo's 
Instagram question now. Let's do it. Yeah, Vivian, you mentioned, um, you know, the advice that you've received from teachers and selecting repertoire for competitions. And we had a question from Matteo Renzi Percussion, that's the IG handle. What's your criteria for choosing repertoire for big competitions like the ARD? Um, well, <clears throat> you don't choose it so much because you have the list, of, obviously. So one criteria would be where because competitions um, in the in, if it's a cool competition, they won't search just for the perfect musician, they will search for a musical personality. So um, you should go for the pieces which which you're strongest at, um, which maybe even is some some strong thing that only you have, I think, in around percussionists this this happens a lot because there's just so many different um things that we can evol evolve in so um choose the pieces that that you feel the most um uh the most that represent your personality and that you're you're the strongest at um and choose your pieces uh also wisely in like first, second round, semi-final and final. Like, uh, I think what I didn't know before was like the semi-final is really where you should keep the good pieces. Like the, don't, don't lose your good pieces in the second or fir first round because first round is anyway, you, they just check if you can play. So first round is just checking, can you hold the mallets? Can you play? Can, do you have a standard uh, level? So then second level, second round is usually you get the like the more difficult pieces like, I don't know, Velocities, Merlin, these things. Mm. So, so it's also, so the second, second round usually is like, yeah, um, already showing you're more than mediocre. And the semi-final is so important that there you show like the really the pieces like, like that do this, you know. Um, I think this is something that I didn't do right actually correctly when I was in RD. I think I think then I because that's why I'm saying this, because I I I noticed this in the competition, like my second round was so strong. I had a I had a frame drum piece which is written. Um uh, like it's really contemporary music but you have all these cool effects um i played velocities and what was the first uh interzone so i felt so safe with the second round and and i knew that i had a really high level there and then in the third round i played maybe pieces like uh side by side which is a really nice piece but maybe more for a first round you know <clears throat> and uh, so you you should in the semi-final and also in trump i see like when i when I see, when I follow Trump, percussion is like in the semi-final, it's, it, it, you need to show that you're a special personality. You have to say something. You're not just interpreting pieces from composers. No, like you, you have a message to say on this stage and uh, you really need to choose your pieces widely, like in the semi-final. Uh, to having your pieces to so you get into the finals and in the finals usually it's uh, you don't have your free free um, like in RD as you don't have the free choice you have just the concertos so yes I think like clever think cleverly um, about the rounds so what is some of the repertoire that you feel like showcases your personality and your strengths the most well, it, I mean, it's different now. Now I would, I would play, I don't know, 13 drums and these pieces. But before, when I was competing, um, yeah, um, you mean, like, yeah, for me, like I would choose things with hand percussion for sure, always, um, because I just love it also, and um, I see there's so many cool things to do there. Um, and I don't know, one study, one summary is a really, really cool piece for competition for for semifinal with, with the junk percussion part. Um, 
what, what, bad touch. <laughs> <laughs> now, Vivi, <laughs> go and tell Casey how bad it is. <laughs> well, it has the name bad in it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I it's a cool piece. Um, I actually, I think Casey is so creative. I love his works. He has so many cool ideas. Maybe sometimes his pieces are a little bit long for, for the public, um, for concerts. So I think that touches, uh, if, if, um, if you make it a little bit short, like I, I'm I didn't play it until now, actually, but I'm planning to play it now. <laughs> so I will start it probably next month. Um, and, uh, I think it's just so so I, I changed a lot you know like since since my time in Salzburg like I changed a lot my mentality so before I would think I would make a concert program like more music more vibraphone more marimba not so much uh setup or or things um because I also was never really convinced I must say from these pieces and since my time in Salzburg I just discovered a completely new way of um, playing these pieces and and I'm so um, fascinated and overwhelmed myself so I want to do it um, and so now when I make my program I try to always to show how much contrast we have we percussionists I never want to play three marimba pieces in a row I always want to show Look, we have we have set up. Look, we have uh, like like Virgin drums. We have like uh, Asian drums, taikos, uh, this energy. Look, and then look, we have hand percussion. Look, we have marimba. Then um, so I would al always show show this contrast. Always have some premier piece also. So this is like the thing I'm the most focused on writing to composers working with composers trying to get new pieces um because there's still so much so much so many possibilities that we have and uh so bad touches is, is a thing it's actually for me it's not so much a percussion percussionist piece it's more like like this uh theater theater um I don't know exactly what it's called there's really genius japanese theater i think it's where they only move and with, with hands so I think someone like this could play bad touch and your jaw would be really open like so I think this is the way we should also um go to to such a piece and I think um you know in the concert you get uh, it's a good contrast if, you, if everything's dark and so I think and somehow bad touch is already a standard repertoire piece so I think you just need to to do it and i think if you really manage to to make it convincing so to have the timing with the music the movements then it then it can be really really cool i think that touch is not so cool when you just do the movements but you, the listener is like okay you have the tape and you have the movements but if you really manage to 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 make the impression for the for the public that actually you make the movement from here because your impulse is so tight then i think it's it's really really a cool piece all right casey we're gonna give you a pass <laughs> your piece could be cool <laughs> or shorter and people knew what to do with it <laughs> no just kidding of course we love casey He's a no i mean my the truth is i wasn't uh i needed time to to get in in love with the piece also but that's amazing i'm gonna i'm gonna chop up all the all the stuff and just make it into a really strange collage that says something that you never said about it no <laughs> don't do that please <laughs> um so to to wrap up the the question about uh mozarteum uh, mateo the same person uh, renzi from instagram asked um how is it to study with uh, Grubinger, especially keeping in mind his busy performance schedule? He's very curious about how you do your lessons with such a busy professor. So can you share that with us? I must say it's completely different from what I expected when I, when I started. Uh, and I must say, I'm, it's so amazing, it's so perfect. Uh, 
I don't know how he does it, but when he has a full, like now he has, of course, no schedule because everything's canceled. But I don't know how, but actually he was there regularly, like if not every week, every two weeks. I don't know how, he, but he manages this. He doesn't sleep. I have no idea. Like he would have a concert in Berlin with uh, the Deutsche Oper <laughs> and then in the morning he would come by plane to Salzburg and then he comes with his suitcase <laughs> he opens a suitcase full full packed of um, mallets and his concert clothes and then he starts um, starts giving lessons at eight o'clock it's amazing I don't know he probably slept like three hours in this night and this is what he does regularly like it's not an exception so he just he just gives everything I don't know. And um, he, he manages to, to be there regularly. It's really, really cool. He like, he really takes his uh, teaching very, very seriously. And he, he supports every, every one of his students, like, uh, like 100%. Like you never have the feeling he would make more lesson with this one or this one or less because maybe not so talented. He, he is very picky about if you work hard. So if you won't work hard, he will, he will, he won't see, of course, uh, investing, his, um, he won't see sense in investing his time, but um, he doesn't expect you to be crazy talented. Like he, he, ex he expects you to just work hard and to have progress in every lesson. And if you do that, he will support you 200%. And I must say, for me, it was a culture shock when I entered in Salzburg. It, like every time I'm like, wow, OK, so this is how it can be. And this is how it should be, actually, you know. But still, it's it's very, very special. Like, it, yeah. Well, Vivi, we had another uh, question about social media and Ksenia kind of referenced this earlier, uh, question from social media, I think I said about, um, from Jesse, pardon my pronunciation, Jesse Guo, uh, that says, could you talk about how you think about chakras and your playing? I think I saw you talk about it in a video, but it was in German, so I didn't understand. <laughs> this is so funny because Actually, I don't think about chakras while my playing, but I think you watched this click like where um, I played the percussion concerto Oraculum, which really cool composer Oriol Kruschen from uh, uh, his Catalan composer, he, um, he wrote it for me and it's called Oraculum. So the soloist is like the oracle and it's not in three movements, it's in seven parts, it's in the seven chakras and every movement, every part, is based on the chakra. So when I'm playing this concerto, yes, I'm absolutely in chakra mood. <laughs> I'm thinking about every chakra and every movement. This is um, this is actually the idea in this concerto. Like the the you know you achieved um, uh, you achieved the thing the right thing in the in this music when the, someone of the public comes out and tells you. I felt my chakras, I felt my, uh, I felt this, uh, how do you, um, voyage, what's in English? Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's travel. I, I felt the travel from, from the first, second, third chakra around, around up. So, so this is, this is what the composer wants. <laughs> and, um, and when I play this music, I think in the chakras because it's, it's, it's really, really, well made he was so inspired by this uh, he's meditating a lot uh, Oriol the composer so the first chakra is the root I am so you have really the roots um, of percussion you have like it starts with these two epic bass drums which you hit like bah, bah, and then the the um, orchestra is like really low and you feel like something's bubbling up and this is the root I am and then the second chakra is already, it's the sacral chakra. I feel it gets more moving. It, uh, you already have this in free, like it's really round, like da 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 And with the orchestra, um, also, also still on drums. So it's still very like earthy and, um, you know, because the chakra is also 
uh, in this place of the body where where it's still more instinct and earthy, which which drums and tom toms and and uh, actually I had daikus yes uh, with daikus can um, can show perfectly and the third chakra is uh, I do uh, solar plexus like energy there it gets really crazy and there you have the first time a really nice melody on the marimba paired with with very irregular rhythms his wife actually is a uh, Serbian she's a cellist is that you, why there's Zaidi Zaidi right? in there exactly yeah, yeah I exactly. heard that yeah <laughs> How cool that you recognized it! How nice! I yes, mean, because Zydis, Zydis, like... um, so Wait. so after the first chakra, you have yeah, <laughs> because the um, it's the fifth chakra. The cadenza is based on on the folk song Zaidi Zaidi from from Serbia, and it's the chakra I speak. It's the throat chakra, and before that we have the heart chakra, the throat chakra. Um, it's a wonderful, really sweet melody uh, on steel drums. Then the Zaidi Zaidi, uh, the throat chakra. Then you have the IC chakra, the sixth chakra. Uh, this is on vibraphone and it gets already really, uh, really round. And, and you have these bright instruments like vibra you have the vibraphone, which already you have the sun, you're already there in, in you're already stepping into Nirvana. And then the seventh chakra is the crown chakra. It's with alufone and it's like really uh royal like like a little bit like to trim trimphatical maybe so in this concerto yes i think about chakras <laughs> but i think this was a mis misunderstanding from this question because because uh, yes it's, it's it has to do with the with this concerto which i love to play it's a really really nice percussion concerto and you play it so 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 well it's it's beautifully <laughs> done it has such a wonderful thank percussion. you Thank you. Um, so there were two more questions that were, uh, I guess, sort of quick from our friend who frequently submits questions, uh, Dimitri Konovalchuk. Uh, his first question is, what is undesirable to do on the day of the concert? Undesirable. Yeah, what would you not want to do on the day of the concert? I can think of a million things like don't run a marathon, <laughs> don't not eat, don't not sleep, you know, I don't well, know you know life gives you everything so i i had all those crazy concert days where the most crazy things happened and then you're on stage and you just have to perform and in this moment it, it doesn't matter what happened before because you're already in your your world and so i i don't feel it realistic to to make such a wish what is undesirable and and i don't want to do it because then i say it and then this will happen so because i had really like uh, things that i don't want to happen again on concerts but they happen so, so life, life's about having having things happen and then it's 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 not about having a perfect life it's about it's about what you, how how you adjust and how how you deal with things that happen. Like, I think earlier I was always very stressed because I, when things bad things happened, uh, especially on concert days, but also in life, I'm like, no, this shouldn't happen. This is not my idea of my life, and this is not a good, <laughs> not a good mentality. The mentality should is like now I I'm I. I, and I'm calmer now because I know, okay, things happen, and it's about it's about um, dealing with them or adjusting with them. And it's the same with Corona. Like you can't wake up every day and think, oh, I want all this to be over. It's more like, okay, I have this. What can I do with that? So <laughs> exactly, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Um, his second question, I feel like uh, Dimitri must see you as sort of like an Olympic athlete because his second <laughs> question was, what do you eat on the day of the concert? It's like, what is your pre-workout meal, Vivi? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I, I eat very consciously every day. So, and I think this is how you should also see the concert day. You should, try, if you want to be you on your concert day, you also need to be this in all the other days so you can um, perform 
at at what you what you know yourself from because if you do things so differently then uh, then then things might might also be different and and you don't want that so but in realistic way i'm happy if i get something to eat in concert day because usually i i travel a lot like most of the times i travel five hours to the concert place then i i get there and the first thing is like unpacking everything um, so carrying unpacking then in after the unpacking it's sound check rehearsal uh, playing usually there's no time to eat <laughs> so um now i'm very happy because my agent always tells promoters that they should organize eat so there's always food it's it's never actually my favorite food because my favorite food is actually vegan and they <laughs> never get this <laughs> So in the day of the country, usually I even don't eat so healthy. I, I would love to, but it's not so realistic because it's more important that my setup is exactly how I need it, that I know I got to know the hall. Because there's there's nothing worse than if your setup is not how it should be. Then then you can have practiced <laughs> as much as you want, but you won't play good to be God. <laughs> So um, yes, it's in in my in my dream world. I would eat um, what I usually eat, like <laughs> a really nice meal with vegetables and I don't know some falafel or some beans. I don't know, like <laughs> and some salad. Um, but I like to eat a lot before the concert if it's possible. But usually I don't have the time. So yeah. <laughs> It reminds me a while back we talked about like pre-concert rituals and I remember hearing some people say it's important to not have pre-concert rituals because like if you have to eat a certain food you have to you know have a certain candle you have to you know you can make the list of 20 different things it's like well if this day you don't have roses in your dressing room all of a sudden you're going to be freaked out by that and play worse so it's actually like maybe better to not have it's a more stress time. than yeah. when you <laughs> And I can imagine for other instrumentalists that this is this is a nice ritual that you can have because they have the time, but we don't have the time. For me, the, the most thing is when I start in the morning, when I tr start traveling in the morning, I eat, I eat a very big breakfast. So yeah, very, very good oatmeal, which will help me to survive if I don't get lunch until the evening. So um yes but there's too much to do for us with the with percussionists so it's exactly what you say it's just more stress if you have and you ah oh, but i need to do this so so my luck will be there <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah ben i was gonna say something similar i think just the flexibility is is definitely a plus if you have in your mind i i used to be like really ritualistic and think the superstition that eating fish before a performance was good because of like omega-3 fatty acids or like you know it's going to support brain health and all that um and it came you know the first time it happened like i can't have any kind of seafood today like what am i gonna do you know and, and so now i'm kind of, you know like i'll eat eat whatever i try to eat healthy but like you said sometimes it's not possible and just that flexibility is is definitely a, a strength <laughs> you know i maybe because in Bulga bulgarians we eat so much garlic so i try not to eat garlic on the concert day because you talk to promoters and you know <laughs> oh god that's, that's funny uh, carly did you have anything else or that was it okay that was it um it. well uh, vivi i had one more question and um you know i've uh, I believe we've all noticed, but maybe I have a particular fixation on on seeing the difference between Europe and the US because I come from one and I now live in the other. Mm -hmm. um, but I've noticed uh, several differences in, in the percussion world. Uh, one is in chamber music, what seems to be the dominant chamber music. I see and I think Germany and Austria could live a life on their own, maybe France too, just on its own. Like it feels like you know, artists who live in those three countries, they don't really need to travel anywhere else because they have so many opportunities to perform and the government supports them well and so on. But in any case, it seems to me like 
percussionists tend to play a lot of mixed chamber music and very serious mixed chamber ensembles. Like you have a duo with uh, your boyfriend who said is a guitar player. Um, we've seen a lot of other players, you know, being with a trumpet or a piano and so on. I feel like in the US, it's a lot of only percussion ensembles. So there's more prominent duos or collectives and so on. And then I saw that in Germany, it seems to be like, or Germany and Austria, trios are a thing, like established trios. If we think of Boom or Colores Trio, these younger guys who who establish mm -hmm. that and you know create their own repertoire. Um, but in repertoire too, there is a, a difference. You know how you mentioned what you would play for ARD, and you mentioned velocities, um, or you said Merlin. But it doesn't seem like many people in Europe play con variations, which is a thing that everybody and their mother plays in in uh, the US. Um, and for some reason it just doesn't doesn't seem to get there have you noticed no, any of that i actually wanted to play con variations i brought i bought the score and i showed to, to when this was when i was studying with sadly yeah i want to play con variations she was like oh no don't do that <laughs> tell us more this is the greatest controversy in the history of this podcast <laughs> I don't know. And then I just, uh, she told me to do something different. And then I did something different. I don't know. Because I think it's a really cool piece. I actually wanted to play it. <laughs> That's so impressive. I'd love to know why he thought it wasn't. Well, maybe it wasn't good for you at that time. But I wonder if he thought that it no, wasn't. No, I don't think it. so. This was already after I did some competitions. It was, I, he, I don't know why he didn't want me to do it. I, <laughs> like I already played some of the big pieces in that sure. <laughs> right right see that's that's very interesting but uh i guess my uh, my segue then is um could you tell us about your approach to chamber music and if uh, i'm gonna ask this now and if you're okay with it um uh, we see the mixed ensembles that exist in the u.s too percussionists and someone are usually people who are partners um so people who are partners in life tend to want to make music together and you know it happens to be that their partner is a flutist, so they try to get some percussion flute repertoire. Or Carly here, uh, her husband is a bassoonist, so you know that oh, is where holding down the percussion and bassoon for. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> She'll premiere so cool. all the works. Um, <laughs> but um, can you can you tell us how how has your partnership, for example, impacted your chamber music project, and how did you pick your other partners in chamber music? How do you pick who you play with? Um, yes, for sure. Um, the with guitar, it's we started because we were together and we wanted to play together. Now I'm very happy that I have this program because it's the one program that's uh, easy, like logistically to do. So I can play it a lot in Bulgaria. And I can fly there. I don't have to travel with the car. Um, I know this sounds maybe not for the music, but it's I, I play all the concerts with so much percussion. I have all the packing things. It's nice to have one program where you just do some music and where you have just some vibraphone and and um but but I started to establish it because um I saw that it has really cool potential, like uh the guitars, like um it has the it has uh, um, similar um, problems like we have, like we don't we don't control the long long tone. But if you are very creative, you can still do a lot of phrasing in agogic um, with marimba. Not so much, but with vibraphone, really a lot. That's why I I also never play marimba actually with guitar. I I played one piece with a guitar player uh, in the guitar world. He, he he's uh, called Elliot Fisk. We played some piece conversation piece what it was called and it was not so i didn't like the color of guitar and marimba but this is my personal opinion i think both is uh, very dark um uh, it's more like a dark instrument so mm, and you can you can you, you cannot do all these phrasing things that i'm talking about um and and with vibraphone if if the guitar and the vibraphone player are really thinking about how to do staccato and short notes and long short, which is normal for pianists and all of the other instrumentalists, but we never think about this. Um, then you can have a really, really 
special chamber music with uh, guitar and um, vibraphone. So now we also have this really cool composers who wrote for us, Sergio Assad. He also wrote for Yo Yo Ma and the cellist. Um, in the guitar world, he's a very respected composer. Um, uh, we had Javier Contreras, a Chilean composer, writing for us. So, so this is so exciting having pieces that that what you say. Like I'm, I'm so um, curious about the premier pieces that you make with bassoon. You have to tell me about that because I love bassoon. I think <laughs> with what are you combining it? No, so so far what we've done is a lot of adaptations like we've done some piazzola a lot of latin american music and yeah i like i do mostly marimba with bassoon and i really like the blend like there's some similarities in the tone and timbre of the two instruments and the of course the register too um but then that he of course can take the sustain where i can't and just a lot a lot of interaction so we, we haven't done any premieres yet. Um, mostly we've just found adaptations, like here's a piece that we can work and we can do it in a, you know, maybe maybe just different way. I was gonna I'm say, definitely not worse. I'm listening to this, so cool. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, with other um, chamber music partners, it, uh, with, with percussionists, of course, I, I try to, um, uh, for example, I have this quartet and uh, there I, I try to play with people that have like the same style and the same thinking because you can be you can play so differently as a percussionist. Um, and and the more I think about it, um, I think it's very important if you do chamber music with percussionists to have the same style because it's so difficult to be completely together and tight. If somebody plays like this and the other plays like this and the other like this, you know, it will never be like knife to knife, sharp, tight. So, so in in chamber music, um, this is very important for me. And with percussionists, um, and with other um, instrumentalists, it's just like what's interesting. Who, who I mean, we're lucky that the other per, uh, instrumentalists are also interested in percussion because we have so many possibilities. I'm very, very happy about um, a, um, a, a new collaboration that I'm going to do with uh, trumpet player Simon Höpele and pianist Frank Dupré. I already played with him. He's also a conductor and they're, they're, they are both so creative and so um, curious musicians and we will play in the Köln Philharmonie and we will have a premier piece for trio, so percussion, uh, trumpet and piano. And also we will play some duos um, with everybody. And uh, yes, but I also have a duo with, with um, another pianist where we have like our established program and uh, I don't know, how do you choose your chamber musician? It's like, it's, it's also a lot of who, you go, who, who you're going to meet, with you, who you have a good chemistry, with who you have the same, same love, like, and uh, mm, patience to like really work through the pieces. For me, it's very important uh, when I work with chamber musicians that they are ready to rehearse a lot not only okay we do two rehearsals and then concert and then it has to be two hours from 10 to 12 like i could never have chamber music with like like some in in my own project like i need someone who is ready to work uh, um in something until it's um until we're all happy you know until we say okay now we we really tried our best to get the potential of the piece um this is maybe one criterion and also the chemistry it's because you when you rehearse like for a couple of days for a week you 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 like when with my percussion quartet i would invite them all to half because everybody could sleep there and like you live with these people it's it's good if the chemistry is okay too <laughs> 
Yeah, of course. It feels like it might be a, a Bulgarian thing to, too, because the three of us have all studied with Svet and there is no such thing as a rehearsal that is two hours. There's the thing that it starts at this hour and then it ends when it's over, which is usually exactly. when you're already been hungry, been sleepy, been <laughs> angry, <laughs> but you have a great chemistry, you have a great understanding, which is super important. But I think it's it's good not to stop when you're angry. Better play music until you get okay again, and then you stop the rehearsal. Exactly. <laughs> Sounds like good relationship <laughs> advice in general, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's like that, isn't it? Like chamber music is relationship because everybody is so authentic in one moment you don't think about being polite or doing your manners that you learned from your parents in one moment you're just it's just emotion and maybe frustration and and then you need to trust these people that yeah it's important <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Vivi, so, so much for being our guest. It feels like we've talked for like an hour and 20 minutes. It flew by. Wow. Like we only scratched <laughs> the surface. <laughs> um, ben, Carly, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Okay. Well, Vivi, it was such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you a lot for the invitation. I was very nice talking to you. And where, where can I listen to Basun and Marimba? <laughs> you have something. <laughs> yeah, we actually, we have, um, we did a concert online in June and I think the link is still up. I'll see if I find it and I'll send it to you. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So cool. That's amazing. And I loved your Stravinsky. I, I'm, I'm blown away how it's possible for, for only the two. And it's, I, I, I didn't feel like some, something was lacking so much. Like well, the uh, energy was there. The energy was there. I have a fabulous Georgian pianist who I made her play enough for 70 people and then I play the flute part sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so she is, that's, that's, what I, that's what you said, you know, she's like the best of friends <laughs> who will take all the weight and I'll just take all the glory sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but thank no, you so it was much really cool I, I loved it <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much we are so looking forward to um these two weeks being done for you and then you being back on stage and especially um something that i personally appreciate so much is your and i don't know how you do this maybe it's maybe it is the fact that you like to eat vegan but you are such a happy, happy presence on stage, and it's so contagious. There's so much it's because I eat vegan. <laughs> because you eat vegan. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. There's a, it's a very special energy that you you bring and and dedication. So thank you so so much. It's such an inspiration to to watch you perform, and I really hope that uh, I'll get to do so live sometime soon. So yes, I hope so too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you everyone for listening. We will catch you on 279. And thank you, Vivi, again for being with us. Cool. Thank all you. Right. And all good for you for the future with this strange times. Thank we, you. We will make it. We will make it. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Ciao.